I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our keynote, Jeannie McGuera. Not McGuerski, right? Um, I've known Jeannie a long time. Easily, it's been 35 or 40 minutes. <laughs> and during that time, we had a few minutes to talk one-on-one, -on -one, and I can tell you that um, I suspect that you are in for a treat this morning. Jeannie is the Chief Program Officer for the EdTech team working on equity and education initiatives. She's the founder and president of the nonprofit Our Voice Alliance and the author of Courageous Adventures. Is there a way that can people buy that book here? They can buy the book at the bookstore. I'll have to buy the book. I, I don't have the book. Um, previously, she was the Chief Innovation Officer at DePlain Public School District 82, the Digital Learning Coordinator for the Academy of the Urban School Leadership, and a Chicago Public Schools teacher, where I think she lives today in Chicago, probably anxious to get back to the weather there in Chicago. <laughs> Jeannie uses her classroom experiences to inform her work supporting educators to create new and better opportunities for their students. She believes that despite the many challenges facing schools today, every classroom can be a place for adventures, e-ventures, um, student-centered, passion-based experiential learning. Her work centers around acknowledging problems and finding innovative ways to navigate them so as to allow teachers and students to dive into these classroom adventures. Um, she's the mother of a one-year-old daughter and uh, hopefully enjoying her time here in Hawaii. And it is my very, very distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Jeannie McGuerra. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Mahalo. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be with you here in Hawaii to share some stories and to learn from all of you. Um, is, how do I switch this over to? Yeah, there we go. So as you heard, um, I am from Chicago. Anyone here uh, originally from the mainland, from the Midwest? One person in the back? A few other? Hello, hello. Um, as we say in Chicago, hello. <laughs> when I uh, told my friends and my family back in Chicago where it's already, we're feeling the, the crispy fingers of winter beginning to haunt us, um, and, you know, as, as everywhere, Christmas is already showing up in all the stores, so we're getting ready for the deep six-month chill that is uh, the majority of our life there. They said, oh, you're so lucky you're going to Hawaii. You must be so excited to go to the beaches and see the sunshine. And that is why most people are excited. That's why my husband was excited to come. That's why a lot of my friends were jealous to come. But the reason that I really, truly love coming to this beautiful state is, yes, you have wonderful weather, your beaches are gorgeous, I do enjoy them, but for me, it's the spam. <laughs> my whole life I've been persecuted for my culinary choices and desires, and yet here I feel truly home, because at any 7-Eleven, at any l, &L drive-in, I'm welcomed with open arms, <laughs> with a delicious sodium-rich treat. And actually, if you were to search my Google Photos, here's a fun tech trick for those of you who don't know. If you go to Google Photos, you can search for things. I could search, you know, birthdays or Hawaii or Musubi. And if I do, I can see how much every single time I come here. Like, most of my photo album when I go to Hawaii are not beach photos or like, look at the beautiful flowers. It's like, look at all the spam that I'm eating. Also, Loco Moco is my jam. So um, I've been very, very excited to be here. Uh, but uh, enough about spam. Oh, I also promised. So another fun tech trip for you today is um, if you find out the keynote speaker's Twitter handle and you DM her, you direct message her directly before her keynote, you can get her to say things on the stage. So did Elisa Bender make it from the parking garage yet? <laughs> yeah, all right. Hi, Elisa. Uh, Elisa direct messaged me about 56 minutes ago, and she said um, she wanted me to do a shout out for the uh, three schools that made the 2019 Blue Ribbon. So shout out to Hickam Elementary. Uh, let me pronounce this right. Yeah. Uh, La Ie Elementary School and Wailua Elementary School. Congratulations on making the 2019 Blue Ribbon. 
And my new bestie, Elisa, hey girl, let's go have uh, some spam after the keynote. <laughs> so um, as, as you heard, I am a lifelong educator. I taught in Chicago public schools. I'm going on my second decade now of uh, being an educator, and I have a lot of stories uh, from my years, as I'm sure many of you do. And what I want to talk to you today about are the untold stories um, that need to be told more in our profession. And to start off this morning, of course, if I'm going to have a keynote about stories, I want to start with one. This one uh, sets off in um, Seoul, Korea. So a little bit further east from here. And it's about a little girl named Kyungshin. Anyone here speak, uh, read Hangul? Can you see this? Yay, hi. So it's about a little girl named Kyungshin. And at the beginning of the story, Kyungshin is nine years old. Now, Kyungshin used to sit around the dinner table with her parents and her siblings, and every single night, her father would tell her about this dream that he had about becoming a medical doctor and moving to the United States of America. Now, on one particular evening, as they sat at dinner, her father smiled at the family and he said, I have done it. I have achieved my dream. We are moving to America. Not only were they moving to America, they were moving to the America that Kyungshin had seen in movies. The America that when she thought of the United States, she pictured the Statue of Liberty, and they were getting to move to New York City. So imagine her excitement when they stepped off the plane, they saw the sights of New York, they stepped into a yellow cab and drove to the exciting streets of Flushing, New York. Those of you who are laughing, you're like, oh, flushing. She's being sarcastic. Um, and uh, it, the adventure just was beginning for her because later that week, her mother told her, Kyungshin, tomorrow, we're going to put on your newest dress, and we're going to go to New York City Hall. And at City Hall, we're going to get you an American name. And for Kyungshin, this was very exciting. It felt like it was like her superhero alter ego, a new American name for her new American life. Now, Kyungshin nor her mother had a lot of experience with, uh, did not have a lot of experience with American names, American monikers. So they went to her next door neighbor and they asked, if you were to have the most idyllic American name for a nine-year-old girl, what would you pick? And the neighbor selected the most timeless, classic, elegant name any young lady could ever hope for, Carol. <laughs> so they walked to City Hall the next day, they walked up to the desk, they stood right up at the front, and Kyungshin's mother said, I would like for my young girl's new name to be Carol. And the City Hall clerk smiled at her and said, sure, how do you spell that? Now, when the neighbor gave her the name Carol, she neglected to write it down, so the mother did not know how to spell it. And she had just moved from Korea. She had just immigrated from Korea. And for those of you who are familiar with Korean phonetics, Carol is not the easiest name to pronounce if you're a native Korean speaker and a non-native English speaker. So when Kyungshin's mother pronounced the name Carol, she said, Kettle. And so the city hall clerk guessed how to spell the name that she heard, and Kyungshin's name became K-E-L-L-O. So, Kello went to school that fall, and on the first day of school, she sat down, and the teacher was reading the attendance roster, and she said to her, oh, that's an interesting name. How do you pronounce, or where, where did it come from? Tell me more. And Kello said, well, it was kind of a mistake. And ever since then, for the rest of her third grade year, she became the little girl with the mistake for a name. The kids would make fun of her. They didn't really know about this country called Korea. They always thought that she was Chinese or Japanese. They didn't know a lot about this other country. They didn't understand why she had a mistake for a name. And Kello, who had been once a very gregarious, silly, fun-loving, brave young girl, became introverted and shy and quiet. And she turned inward and lost her voice. It wasn't until grade four when she was sitting once again for her first day of school where little Kello sat at her desk fearing when her name was going to be called. And this time, the teacher asked her a different question. She didn't ask, oh, that's a funny name. Where did it come from? She said, what would you like to be called? Oh, 
this year. And when she said to her, what would you like to be called this year, little Kello thought to herself, no one's ever asked me that before. When I was born, my parents didn't say, would you like to be named Kyungshin? When she went to City Hall, her mother didn't say, what would you like to be called? So she thought to herself, who do I see myself as? And she thought and she thought, and she had recently read a book. And in the book, uh, there was a young girl, and her name was Katie. Katie the Great, and Katie was brave, and Katie was funny, and Katie was smart, and she thought to herself, that's who I really am on the inside. So she looked at her teacher and she said, my name this year is Katie. She went home and she told her mother and father, I want to be called Katie. She actually, when she got older, legally changed her name to Katie. And you want to know about that little girl, Katie? She did grow up to be brave, and she did grow up to be very funny, and she did grow up to be very smart, and she also grew up to become my mother. That's me and my mom in a really cool fanny pack. My mother would tell me this story over and over again when I was a little girl. I would come home from school sometimes really salty, upset at something that happened or mad at my teacher because they yelled at me for something I didn't even do. And I'd say, Mom, my teacher, I hate her. And my mother would say, Jennifer. She always called me Jennifer. She never called me Jenny. She said nicknames are for weak people, <laughs> which is weird because she has a whole story about her name. Anyway. She would say, Jennifer, you listen to your teacher when they're talking to you. You listen to your teacher because one day your teacher is going to ask you a question that could change your life. You listen to your teacher because teachers can help you be your whole self. My mother attributes her fourth grade teacher to becoming the woman she was. My mother was a strong, brave, funny, smart woman, and she always said what she thought. She wasn't shy. She lived her full self, and she said, had that teacher not asked her that question, had allowed her to be who she truly was, she wouldn't be the woman she became. So my mother would tell me this over and over again, but the thing about that is had the teacher not asked her that question, she would have continued living that single story. Nigerian author Chimamanda, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks to us in her TED Talk about the danger of the single story. She tells us that there are these stories that are pervasive about groups and types of people in the world that are told over and over and over again until be, they become the only story that is known about that particular group or type of people. And the thing she says is that stereotypes aren't wrong they're just incomplete. So one story about one person does not make it a fact. For example, there is a stereotype about Asian women that they are not the best operators of motorized vehicles. <laughs> My mom, great driver. My sister, wonderful driver. Never a ticket, never an accident. I have totaled three cars. I am a, that's why I've lived in a city for the past 20 years. I take public transportation. I'm not a good driver. However, just because it's true about me does not mean it's true about everyone else. When we live by retelling single stories over and over and over again, we're further increasing and exacerbating stereotypes and biases about each other. These single stories mean that there are tons of untold stories that could help shatter them, that could help people have more full and not pervasive understandings of everyone around them, create deeper empathy. You heard from a keynote speaker yesterday about the power of social emotional learning and a lot of that is having empathy for one another. When I think about the educational industry, about teachers, students, our communities, we are ripe with stereotypes. There are so many single stories about the kids that we serve, about the communities we live in, and about educators and who we are as professionals that need to be shattered. And the best way to do that is by focusing on the untold stories and elevating the stories that need to be told. And so today, I want to share with you in the time that we have five untold stories about education that I hope are elevated and amplified to shatter some of these stereotypes.
The first one is about the single story of student self-image and the untold story of limitless potential. Now, prior to my current role, I was a district administrator in a public school district right by Chicago O'Hare Airport. Uh, if you ever fly into Chicago O'Hare Airport, you will probably be delayed or your flight might get canceled because it is the worst airport ever in the world. Uh, but the good news is, is you can come visit our schools because there's a really amazing public school district that's walking distance from the airport that you can come hang out on when your flight's canceled. We have heats uh, that you can stay warm in. Now, as the chief innovation officer for the, for the school district, one of my roles was writing grants to get us more access to opportunity and resources for our children. And I was very excited in my first few months of joining that district that we won a grant to help support K-5 coding uh, curriculum in all of our schools. We used that money to fund these, uh, for the purchase of these robots, Dash and Dot from Wonder Workshop. Anyone see these before? Whee! Um, they might, I'm, perhaps there's some in one of the playgrounds here for you guys to play with. Uh, but for those of you who haven't had experience with Dash and Dot, is they're little robotic companions for children that allow them to see uh, kinesthetically, physically, um, the effects of their coding. So they code out movements and then they can see the robots do the movements so they can kind of get a tangible reinforcement for their understanding of writing code. Now, we created an entire curriculum for our K-5 students and kicked it off with a week of coding. And I was really excited because until then, we only had computer science opportunities for middle grades and above. On my first day of joining uh, the students for the uh, day one of this coding week, I saw three of my favorite students sitting in the corner, box of dash and dot left unopened, iPads face down, full face pouts, arms crossed, facing the wall. So I walked up to them and I said, what's going on? Why aren't you coding? Is everything okay? And they looked at me, rolled their eyes, put their hands on their hip like only a nine-year-old can do and said, ugh, Ms. McGarra, we can't code, we're just girls. Yeah. So I took a deep breath and I could feel the bubbling frustration and rage inside of me and I thought, well of course, of course they think they can't code. Look at the media today. Look at what the messages are. These single stories they're getting about who can be computer scientists and who couldn't. I mean, you look at mass media today and every single computer scientist you see is a boy. I mean, look, Steve Jobs, he's a boy. Sergey Brin, he's a boy. Mr. Robot, he's a boy. Where's Mrs. Robot? I don't know. We don't have one of those shows. So no wonder these girls think they can't because they are focused on these single stories of male-centric scientists. Let's cancel Computer Science Week, do an entire thing about uh, gender equity, busting stereotypes, let's go. Now, at that moment, I had to take a deep breath. Namaste. Slow my roll, I had to think for a moment about what would any mature adult school district administrator do in this situation. And so I looked the girls right in the eye and I said to them, Katie, Bianca, Daria, I triple dog dare you to code. <laughs> mature adult district professional. They said, excuse me? And I said, I triple dog dare you to code. And they were, they were a little bit confused and they were like, well, what do we get if we do that? If you triple dog dare us and it doesn't work out, what happens? And I said, well, I think that you're going to be so in love with coding and so capable of learning how to code that if you can't code by this time tomorrow, you can spend the rest of the week doing whatever you want. They're like, we can do whatever we want? And I said, yeah. They're like, we could just play Fortnite for four days? And I'm like, sure. They're like, we could just go on Snapchat? I was like, sure. The principal was standing behind them like, what are you doing? <laughs> do not, be, are you out of your mind? I'm like, it's cool. I work in the district office. I got this. Now, this whole thing happened on Monday. Remember that my deal with this, these girls were that they were going to be able to code by Tuesday morning. At the end of the week, on Friday, they created this video. I want you to pay attention to the days of the week they put in it to see how my bet with them went.
So, quick uh, reading test. Remember my deal with the girls was made on Monday. What day did they create this video? Thursday. So Tuesday, I walk back into the room. I feel very confident. I see the girls. I say, Katie, Bianca, Daria, good morning. How did it go? I see Dash and Dot still in the boxes, so my confidence starts to go down a little bit. Uh, but they're not quite pouting. So I said, did you learn how to code yesterday? And they're like, actually, no. It was, it was actually really hard. We didn't, I don't think we really got it. I said, OK, all right. Well, I guess you can do whatever you want for the rest of the week. A deal is a deal. So what would you like to do? And Bianca says, actually, Miss McGarra, we want to keep coding. And I said, <laughs> really? <laughs> Don't you love it when your teacher Machiavellian plans come to life? You're like, ha ha, dance, puppets, yes. <laughs> so they said, yeah, actually, we want to keep coding. And they said, oh, mm, tell me more. And they said, well, we discovered that coding is like a language. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, and as you learn your, the language, it's easier to speak to the robots. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, and coding's actually really creative. It's really fun. We think we can do it. And I said, really? And they said, we even came up with an idea to use code to solve a problem. And I said, really? You see, Katie, Bianca, and Daria, their, their greatest desire in life were to be professional dancers. And they were part of our uh, elementary school dance troupe. The problem was Katie, Bianca, and Daria had a recital coming up that Friday. And Katie, Bianca, and Daria were actually a quartet. The fourth girl was out sick with mono. And that nasty bug you know takes more than a few days to heal from. And they had an entire complex choreography that they needed four dancers for. So they were thinking, are we going to have to cancel our performance? And then they met Dash and Dot. And they realized that they could use code to teach Dash how to be the fourth member of their dance crew. And that's what you see in this video. Now, it was incredibly inspiring to see these girls turn around their single story from uh, self-doubt and renewing a self-image of hope and opportunity. But what was especially inspiring about this was that the girls saw a way to use code to solve a problem and then realized that they should be telling more people about how they could use code to solve real-world problems. In fact, when I talked to them about this and reflected on the learning experience, they were a little bit embarrassed. They said, we're really ashamed that we said we can't do something just because we're not boys. Girls can do anything boys can do. And I said, that's right. And they're like, we should tell more people. And I said, that's right. And they said, Miss McGarra, let's make a viral video. <laughs> I was like, OK. So they created this. Can you tell their dancers they choreograph the video? They're like, now. Now, in this story, what I want us to really take home is that this is one of many single stories of self-image our students are getting from stories, from media, from popular icons, from society in general. These single stories of self-image are not things that we can necessarily stop, but we can combat them, we can shatter them by continuing to give them the untold stories of students who look like them, who come from similar backgrounds, who have similar beliefs, who are able to overcome adversity and have access to any opportunity they set their mind towards. And if there isn't another story out there about someone who looks like them, sounds like them, is from a place like them, doing the thing they want to do, inspire them to become the first of that story so they can have others follow in their path. And most importantly, inspire them to tell that story, to elevate those untold stories, just like Katie, Bianca, and Daria did. My second story for you is about the, un the single story of teachers and the untold story of wizards. Now, as I told you, I'm a lifelong educator. And for me, that has a lot to do with identity. Uh, what I mean by that is, for example, my husband, Jim, is an attorney. Boo. 
And if you were to meet him um, at your local L&L, as he's waiting for my Spam Simon order, he uh, and you might start chatting. He's a very friendly guy, despite being a lawyer. Uh, and you would find out so many things about him. You'd find out that he is a huge Chicago Cubs fan, that he loves microbrews. He has been drinking his way up and down the island. Um, and he also uh, loves to barbecue. We have four grills on a teeny tiny Chicago balcony. There's no room for humans on our balcony, just barbecue grills. But what you would not find out about him is that he is an attorney. And the reason why, no matter how long you were to chat with my husband, you would uh, find that out unless you were to directly ask him is because he says, being a lawyer is just what I do for my job. It's not who I am as a person. But if you and I were to meet up at the local l &Ls and we were chatting, um, you would find out within the first 30 seconds that I'm an educator. You would find out about that because I don't stop talking about it. And the reason why it's always part of what I talk about, it's part of who I am, is because being an educator is not just what I do, it's who I am as a person. It's part of my identity. It's inside of me. And because of that, my identity as an educator is really uh, important to me, what that means and who I am and what I do with that. And the first time that I really came to terms with educator, being an educator as an identity, was my fourth grade teacher, Miss Buckman. Now until Miss Buckman, I had your very traditional teacher who was the kind of like, children should be seen and not heard type teacher. Like we had to sit at our desks, hands folded, mouths quiet, facing forward, doing worksheet after worksheet, and we just kind of sat quietly for 10 months until the end of the year. And we can finally have like a month and a half of like running around and being human beings, and then it was sit and be quiet again. Until at the beginning of my fourth grade year, we all filed into our desks, sat down, stock still, facing forward, waiting for our teacher to come to the front of the room, and we looked left and we looked right and we realized something is amiss. Now, in the school that I grew up in, there was always an adult watching you no matter where you went. Even during restroom breaks, the teacher would have like one foot in the door, one eye kind of watching to make sure nothing amiss was happening. It was like the eye of Sauron. They were just always there. <laughs> but at that first day of fourth grade, we were all sitting there waiting for our teacher to give us our first worksheet, and no one came in. There was no adult. Now, this was obviously kid time, but in my mind, we were there for about 10 hours, and no adult walked in. Until suddenly, this woman, she had her shirt untucked, she only had one shoe on, her hair was all messed out on one side, there were leaves coming out of it, one earring was unhooked, she literally blew into the room with all of these bags, knocking over a desk, and she started running around and turning over chairs and looking under waste baskets shaking her head and muttering to herself. And we thought to ourselves, this is why adults are always watching us, because you don't know who's going to walk in. And all of a sudden, she makes eye contact with us, and we're like, oh no, the crazy woman sees us. She said, what are you doing? I need your help. I've lost my pet dinosaur, Jeff. If we don't get him immediately, he might eat someone. Please help me. Now, part of us is saying, a crazy lady's yelling at us, don't move, maybe she won't notice us. It is literally like the dinosaur in Jurassic Park, like if you stay really still, maybe they won't see you. But then the other part of us was like an adult giving us permission to run around and throw things, so option two. So we start running around, and we're like, woo, find the dinosaur. And then this lady slams both of her hands on a table and says, everyone freeze. I'm so sorry. I've lost my mind. We're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> I left my pet dinosaur, Jeff, at home to guard the fountain of youth. I saw some cumulonimbus clouds coming in. I thought perhaps it would rain later. And of course, we don't want to dilute that water. I'm so sorry. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Miss Buckman, boys and girls. Please have a seat. We are already late for our first adventure. And then we thought, oh, good God, this woman is our teacher. <laughs> now, this was such a departure from the single story of what I thought a teacher could and should be. 
Miss Buckman flew into the classroom every single day with another harebrained scheme. She had a new adventure for us to go on, and every morning she said so. She said, boys and girls, good morning. We're already late for our adventure. On Sunday nights, Miss Buckman did not spend time alone at her kitchen table writing lesson plans, but instead concocting adventures for us to go on the next day. I, I myself, had that same bug that uh, Bianca, Katie, and Daria's fourth friend had. I had mono in fourth grade, and yet I faked being well to go to school because I didn't want to miss one of the adventures. I got half my class sick because uh, it's incredibly <laughs> contagious. But I was like, Mom, I'm fine. I got it. It's cool. <laughs> Let's go to school. I didn't want to miss anything she had. I remember sitting on the carpet later that year reading a book that Miss Buckman had given me, The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Any other Tolkien fans in here? Hey, fantasy, yeah. And I remember this quote uh, from the beginning of the book that really stuck with me. Now, if you're not a fantasy fan, let me give you a quick, uh, a quick synopsis, no spoilers. But the main two characters that you need to know for this quote is there's a, a tall wizard named Gandalf the Grey, and he loves adventures. He's super brave. He always wants to go out and do cool things. And then there's this little hobbit named Bilbo Baggins, very meek, very shy, does not like adventures, just wants to stay home. And one day, Gandalf walks up to Bilbo's door, knocks on it, and he says to him, I am looking for someone to share an adventure that I'm arranging. And as I sat there, a little fourth grader sitting on the carpet, this sentence was so inspiring to me for many reasons. One being that an adventure could be something that you could just decide to have, that it wasn't something that you had to wait to happen to you, but you could have the agency to be like, I choose to have an adventure. And the second, that you can invite others to it. Like, I've arranged this lovely adventure for three. Shall we, shall we do this together? Please come. RSVP, yes. And so as I sat there reading this quote and thinking to me how inspiring this was, I had this light bulb moment. I thought, oh my God, teachers are wizards. And it was at that moment on the carpet, holding Tolkien's The Hobbit, reading these words that I thought to myself, when I grow up, I want to be a wizard. I want to be a teacher. I want to spend every single day arranging adventures for students. I want to spend, I want to choose to have an adventure every single day and I want to invite other little boys and girls like the kids in my classroom to be inspired the way that Miss Buckman inspires me. And so there are so many single stories of teachers out there in sitcoms and late night shows and books in people's memories, but I inspire all of us to channel that inner wizard. I know so much wizardry is happening in each of your classrooms and the classrooms you support. And we need to tell those stories to help the world see the wizardry that's happening in our rooms, to see the magic that we create every single day. Now, my third story is about the single story of resistant colleagues and the untold story of friendly dragons. When I had that moment of OMG, teachers are wizards, and I decided to become a teacher, I did follow that path. I grew up, I became a teacher, I worked in Chicago public schools for many years, I won an iPad grant, and I got to bring technology into my classroom. I did cry for the first three months, not really knowing what was going on, but I, I persevered, I overcame it, and eventually I became a technology coach. And in that first year of being a technology coach, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to arrange adventures for my colleagues. Now, the problem was uh, actually hidden in the second half of this quote that I didn't really foresee. You see, Gandalf the Grey does knock on Bilbo Baggins' door and invite him to go on this adventure. But for those of you who are fellow Tolkienites and have read this book or, or seen the movie, you would know that when he invites him to go on this adventure, Bilbo Baggins RSVPs no. Hard no. You see, it's very hard for Gandalf to find anyone to adventure with. And the reason uh, that he says that it's hard, you know, if you go on is, uh, Bilbo Baggins replies, I should think so. Uh, adventures are nasty things. They make you late for dinner. 
And this is exactly, word for word, what my colleagues would say to me when I tried to invite them to adventures to innovate in their classrooms. I would say, I want to try this really amazing new strategy with you, or I'd love to introduce you to this new tool or uh, protocol that could really help create much more magic in your classroom. And they'd say, no, it's already four, it's traffic, don't want to be late for dinner. I walked into my first professional learning experience where I was going to do PD for the entire school that I had already served in for 10 years. I thought it was going to be the most exciting PD ever. I had created all of these hands-on activities. I brought candy, as you do. I had post-it notes and Sharpies. I mean, come on. It was going to be a riot. And as I walked in, pushing my cart of iPads and baskets of candy, iPads, everything, all of the teachers looked at me, smiled at first, because I was their friend, Jenny. And then they looked at the iPads, oh no, we're not doing that. And they literally stood up and walked out the back door of the room. Like, they didn't metaphorically run away from me, they actually physically ran away from me. <laughs> and I was really upset about it. I was like, I made post-it notes. So I called my mom. And I said, Mom, I don't like being a coach. Teachers are mean. I hate it. I want to teach fifth graders. They're nicer. <laughs> My mother said to me, Jennifer, Jennifer, they're not doing what you want them to do. And I said, no, I hate them. And she said, Jennifer, remember what I told you about the dragon. OK, Mom. So my mother and father had this painting over their bed when I was growing up. And um, it, this is the only picture I have of it from when they were moving out of their house. But you can see it there. And it was uh, this uh, place in South Korea um, with, that has this uh, rock formation that looks a little bit like a dragon head. And my mother would tell me this legend about this dragon head. Now, quick uh, disclaimer. As my mother told me the story my whole life and had this really empowering message behind it, I was really excited as an adult to actually go to visit this actual uh, rock formation in South Korea. And when I got there, I looked at the plaque, looking, getting excited to read the story that my mother had told me, and I realized that for my entire life, my mother had lied to me <laughs> and completely made up the story just to prove her point. I call these mom facts. They're creative license with the truth where you lie to your children to make you right. The, pr the good thing about this, though, is this. I actually really do like this made up, completely lie of a story that my mother told me. So I'm going to tell it to all of you now. But just know that it, it's made up. It's a, it's a Katie Cho original. Now, my mother would tell me the way this fake story went was uh, this dragon rock um, had a village around it at the base of a mountain. And this village was a pretty decent village. It was OK. But at the top of the mountain was something that would just take it from good to great. It would make it amazing. Like It was like unlimited Wi-Fi and spam musubi for days. So they really wanted to get that thing at the top of the mountain. The problem was, is right before you got to it was a dragon. So if you tried to go up the mountain, the dragon would eat you. So a little bit of a problem. One day, a very brave villager decided to get his walking stick, battle the dragon, and get to the top of the mountain. So he starts climbing the mountain. He sees the dragon. He sees the dragon's fiery breath coming out of his nostrils. And as he raises his weapon to fight the dragon, he notices that the dragon's arm is covered in thorns. So he puts down his weapon and he says to the dragon, I'm sorry, that looks really painful. Can I help you? And the dragon, mid-roar, about to bake a big old chomp of Mr. Villager, stops and says, excuse me? No one's ever asked me if they could help me before. Yeah, that would be great. So he leans down and the villager starts plucking out all the thorns out of his arm and he puts whatever the Korean version of Neosporin is all over his arm. <laughs> And as the dragon starts to heal and starts to feel better, his scales melt away, his horns and fangs melt away, and he shrinks down to reveal that the whole time he was another villager. 
So villager one says to him, oh my God. Oh my God, it's so good to see you, Kevin. Where have you been? <laughs> Actually, it's Korea, so it's not like Kevin, it's more like, Young Chul, how's it been? <laughs> and Young Chul says, oh, you know, funny story, I was headed up the mountain to get, you know, the spam and the Wi-Fi, and, and I fell in this thorn bush. And I got all these thorns in my arm, and, and every time another villager came up the path, instead of trying to help me, they'd try and get around me or try and get me to help them, and I got angrier and angrier and angrier, and I, I just started eating them, because, you know, <laughs> dragon life. So, my mother would tell me this story whenever I would get frustrated at someone else, when I would be mad that they didn't want them to do, that they didn't want to do the thing that I wanted them to do. And I would think, why won't they just do this thing that I want them to do? It makes so much sense. Why can't they agree with me? And my mother would say, have you ever thought about the dragon? Have you ever thought that you're so focused on your goal that you're not seeing what they need? If you can take a minute to pause, see their needs, and be patient enough to help them first, you would be so surprised that they could actually have the same goal as you in the long run. And so I took that message back to my role as being a technology coach, and I began working with my teachers again, and instead of seeing them as resistant dragons who were blocking my way and refusing to do what I wanted to do and eating up all of my great ideas, I tried to see the inner wizard in each of them. I met with each teacher and for every single one-on-one, -on -one, I would start with, what are your challenges? Let me put aside my needs of technology integration and so I did things from working with them with families to unjamming copy machines to helping them think through a challenging student and when I did that, it built so much trust and relationship that I was able then to work with them to create common goals where we could both meet our needs. And the thing about this was every single teacher I worked with over the next three years met or exceeded their technology integration goals that the district had laid on them. Not one more time did they run away from me during PD. They ate all of my candy and used all my Post-its. And so that untold story of friendly dragons, I really hope you see that there are these single stories of colleagues who are resistant, who are, for those of you who know Roger's innovation curve, we're at the uh, back end of it, but all educators, I truly believe, deep down, are doing what they believe is best for students. And if we can sit down, see their needs, pull the thorns out, we can see them become wizards as well. Now, my fourth, or my penultimate story for you is about the single story that we tell the world and the untold story of our inner selves. How many of you are on Facebook right now? <laughs> oh God, when's this keynote over? I'm gonna go ahead and check in on Facebook. What's Susan doing? Um, now, for those of you who are on Facebook, Perhaps you feel as I do, where sometimes you're on Facebook and, you know, it's fun. You're like, oh, look at, you know, my old high school friends. What are they up to? My old high school crush, what's he up to? What are people doing? Uh, but sometimes Facebook makes you completely and utterly miserable. And uh, Seth Soden, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, Seth Stevens Davidovitz is a New York Times uh, journalist who actually wrote a really interesting um, op-ed about this a few years ago. Don't let Facebook make you miserable. I actually saw this article on Facebook as I was miserable. So it was like the perfect targeted ad for me. I was like, yes, click, I am miserable on Facebook. And Seth perfectly described the reason why Facebook can make you miserable, which is that some of us, many of us, have that Facebook friend or family member who whenever they show up in your newsfeed is always living hashtag best life ever. <laughs> Every single time you see them, they're on vacation somewhere amazing, like Hawaii, <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> And every time that you see their family, they're like perfectly happy together, their kids are always smiling for the photos, standing up straight, don't have any spills on them, their house looks perfect, they have another house for some reason, just like everything looks amazing. And you're like, I hate you. You make my life look like garbage, so I hate you. Now, 
The thing that Seth says, though, about these people is not just that they're making us miserable, but that they are liars. <laughs> and he set out to prove it using his crafty journalism skills. So he went out and he looked at social media. And he saw that, for example, Americans, on average, spend um, about uh, six times as much time during a year doing dishes as they do playing golf. And yet, they tweet about golf three times more often. Like, no one's out there tweeting like, man, just wash that dish, hashtag best dish ever, yeah. <laughs> Living that dawn life, mm-hmm, palm olive is my jam. How many of you have been to Las Vegas? Ooh, yeah, Vegas. And if you haven't been to Las Vegas, perhaps you've seen movies like Ocean's Eleven about Las Vegas, where you see this beautiful hotel, the Bellagio, with the fountains in the front. Now, this luxury hotel, the Bellagio, has the same number of hotel rooms as the discount hotel, Circus Circus. And yet, people check into the Bellagio five times as often as at Circus Circus. They're like, yeah, I'm at the Bellagio for real, checking in. JK, I'm at Circus Circus. <laughs> now, this is an educator event, though, so let's talk about literary habits. How many of you have heard about the very esteemed, prestigious periodical, The Atlantic? It's a good magazine. A few of us are raising our hands. OK. They have really great hard-hitting articles like 50 Greatest Inventions Since the Wheel. Now, how many of you have heard of this also very esteemed, very prestigious periodical called the National Enquirer? <laughs> Few of us? Okay, good. Now, the National Enquirer also has very important reporting, such as Skynet is a reality. We know because Tony Stark says so, go home and smash your iPhones immediately. Now, the Atlantic uh, and the Enquirer, so the Enquirer sells three times the number of copies every year as the Atlantic. And yet, would anyone like to guess how many more times or how much more often do people claim to read the Atlantic on Facebook than the National Enquirer? <laughs> Just shout it out. Ten times. Ten times. Eight times, okay. I'm going to turn this bar graph sideways so you can see. Forty-five more times. There are 45 more claims to reading the Atlantic on Facebook than the National Enquirer. They're like, yeah, I read that article. It was about inventions. There were 50 of them. It was great. They've been since the wheel. Oh my god, you got to read it. Or just look at the cover. <laughs> now, Seth Stephen Devadovitz goes on to say, uh, he quotes this famous maxim. Don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. Now, that's, that's a famous saying that people have, but he adds to it, but that's hard to do because people don't often show us their insides. So we're constantly comparing our lives to this curated false narrative that other people are sharing about their lives. I thought for a second about this, and I was like, interesting, interesting. So what is really happening in people's lives. Well, this amazing op-ed goes on to tell us because Seth Stephen Savadovitz went on to look at Google Analytics for that year. And he said, when people are saying, I'm always doing this thing, I'm always on vacation, having brunch, taking selfies, living hashtag best life ever, what are they actually doing? And where can you find the most honest version of people? And he said, Google search results. If you look at Google searches, that's what people are. They're lying in bed at 2 in the morning Googling the things that people don't want to know, usually on incognito mode. And he saw the top four results for I always on Google search in 2017 were I always feel tired, have to pee, have <laughs> diarrhea, and am bloated. So these things are not mutually exclusive. You can like always be on vacation and having brunch and have also like severe gastrointestinal disorders at the same time. But the thing is, is people are only talking about column A, not about column B. And so as we go back to that maxim of living best life ever, I decided to uh, audit my own Facebook feed to see if I'm a Facebook liar, if I'm doing it. And of course, yes, I am. <laughs> 
you know, I'm not like, oh my God, peed yesterday, hashtag bathroom life. I was like, look, I'm on vacation in Iceland, best life ever. I'm going indoor skydiving with my friends and family. I'm sitting by a mountain by a pool. Aren't you jealous? Ha ha. So I reflected on Seth Stephen Devadovitz's message about how we're not sharing our insides with each other, that when we're trying to compare our lives and see how we're doing, people need to be more honest, to not tell that single story of, my life's perfect, don't you worry. And so I made a promise to myself right then and there, looking at my computer on Facebook, and I said, the next time that I'm going through something real, I'm having a struggle, I'm going to be braver and I'm going to share it on Facebook. And it just so happens that shortly after I read this article, uh, I came to a crossroads that I was having a real challenge. You see, my husband, Jim, and I had been having an issue for the past six years. Was it a marital issue? I like the Cubs okay, micro beers are fine, grills, I don't hate them. But uh, we'd been trying to start a family. And we really, really, really wanted to have kids. I don't know if you guys know how babies work, but it takes longer than six years to have a child. And so, as you might guess, we had a lot of starts and stops, a lot of losses, and a lot of failures. And at this point, we were trying to decide if we should take um, the next step, and I was scared. I was scared for so many reasons. And the problem was, is when I looked at Facebook, and I saw my feed, it wasn't helpful. Um, when you're going through a problem that is especially emotional, when you have a, a goal that you want with your deepest heart and you continuously fail it, the world is cruel sometimes, where it so happens that the more you want something and the more elusive it becomes, the more easy it seems to everyone else around you. And so as I looked at my Facebook feed, I saw all of my friends, family members, having so many babies. I had this one friend where like literally she sneezed and another baby came out. <laughs> like I was like, I, I hate you, I hate your uterus, like we just unfriend. <laughs> now as my husband and I were thinking about taking this next step, I really wanted advice. I was scared, I didn't know what to expect. I, I was just not sure and Google wasn't doing it for me. So I said to him, I said, Jim, would it be okay with you if I posted about this on Facebook? Nobody knows we're, we've been going through this, but I'd, I, one person, one of our friends, maybe has been going through it too. I'd love to hear from them. He said, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I don't even know how Facebook works. Just do whatever you want, Jenny. So I was like, okay, cool. So I went ahead and I, I posted this. And I was so scared after I posted it. Like the second I hit post, I immediately freaked out. I was gonna delete it. And Jim said, let's go take a walk. And when we come back, if you still hate that you put it up there, you can delete it. And so we went and took a walk. When we came back an hour later, I had over 288 likes, loves, whatever you call them, on my post, 75 comments, and what's more is in the next week I had people calling, texting, showing up at my door, reaching out to me at work, telling me that I wasn't alone, saying to me, thank you for sharing that. We actually went through the exact same thing that you guys are going through. In fact, see these 85 children I have? That's how we got them. In fact, I don't even like these three, so if you want them, <laughs> we can donate them to the cause. You can take them on loan, keep them forever, they suck. So, Jim and I were so relieved to find out that we weren't alone. And, and there's something, just as the world can be so cruel, that when you're, you have a goal set in sights that you're trying for and it seems so elusive, there's something so incredibly heartwarming when you think you are the only person facing a struggle only to realize the lights come on in a room and you look and you look right and you see that you're surrounded by others who are not only sharing in the struggle but who have been successful and have shown you that it is worth persevering. 
And so Jim and I decided to continue persevering and continuing to try on this road. And as you heard from the introduction, uh, we were able to move on to the next step, which uh, led to this, which led to this, which led to, oh yeah, she's like super Asian already. She's like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you taking a photo? What's up? Uh, which led to her. This is Lucy. On uh, lucky year number seven, we had our little Lucy, and um, I now use Facebook to take photos of myself mocking her, as any good mother would. Um, I also have been using Facebook to uh, document her time here in Hawaii. This is my daughter jet lagging on night one, where she just fell asleep in her plate of, of fish. And of course, um, I had to uh, introduce her to the things that matter most important to me, so she had her first musubi here as well. <laughs> and my husband was like, of course she likes it, it's just sodium. Um, now, for me, this was so empowering because I realized the single story of how families begin and how you struggle and what could happen um, was really blocking me. The reason that I was so desolate during our fertility struggle wasn't just the struggle itself, but it was feeling like there was something specifically wrong with me. That I, as a woman, as a person, was failing and I was the only one in the world who couldn't do this thing. And as I looked outward into my career, I wondered, are there similar single stories that we're curating our professional lives and making it more difficult for others to overcome challenges by only showing that best life ever in our teaching careers? The answer is yes. As I told you, I was a tech coach, and before that, I was quote unquote an award-winning teacher. So I had, you know, been brought on stages in Chicago public schools to be like, look at this lady doing cool stuff with iPads. And I was like, hey guys, look how easy it is. I make YouTube videos about math. And I would speak at conferences and I would tell people, it's so easy to differentiate using iPads. You can create these little videos, your kids come in and they get this just right video playlist differentiated just to their needs and you can create small groups in your classroom. It's auto magical. And everyone in the audience would be like, okay. But they'd leave and be like, well, it's easy for her, but it won't be easy for me. Everything is easy for her when she does tech. She's the tech lady. They see me come into rooms and they literally run away because they're like, I'm not her, I can't do it. I experience failure when I do it. Everything is easy for her, she sneezes and innovation comes out. <laughs> now, I would tell this story about creating these differentiated videos and the way the story usually went was that I walked in on my first day creating 10 differentiated math videos for my students and they sat down and they put on their headphones and they hit play on the iPads and I pulled a small group to work with them on the corner and my kids sat silently for three minutes basking in the math euphoria. It was magical and I thought truly am I, I am a wizard for I have made 36 fourth and fifth graders silent for three whole minutes. <laughs> but I didn't tell them the untold part of this story. The untold part of the story that I had edited out to tell hashtag best teaching life ever was that at the three minute and one mark, my little student Brittany started to laugh and then Jaheem started to laugh and then Lakeisha started to laugh. And I'm thinking to myself, that's interesting. Volume of the pyramid is not the most humorous of topics. So I go and I look at Brittany's iPad and to my horror, I had not downloaded this very thoughtful, very pedagogically sound series of math videos that I had painstakingly taken the whole week to create, but instead the 2010 raunchy rated R comedy hit Hot Tub Time Machine. <laughs> onto all of my students' iPads, and they had been watching it for three whole minutes. <laughs> so at that point, I thought to myself, oh, it was nice being a teacher for a little while. 
guess my fallback, I could be a lawyer or something later. I had 36 really interesting conversations with parents that night. A really interesting conversation with my class, a really scary and interesting conversation with my principal. But I lived to see another day. I learned from my mistakes. We talked to students about media choices, and I was very careful uh, not to sync terrible movies to my kids' iPads ever again. I also made some better choices about movies that I rented at home as well. <laughs> The moral of the story, though, is that I continued to iterate on the process, not just not syncing rated R movies to my kids' iPads, but learning how to better sync them, what to do with the time when I was pulling small groups, how to create better instructional content for my kids, and I did persevere, and I made more mistakes. I did not do this again, but I did continue to make more mistakes. And when I began to change the way that I presented about this strategy, by telling about the mistakes as much as I told about the success, is I saw so many more people willing to take risks and try to move towards building those opportunities for kids. They saw, yes, this road isn't perfect, she's not perfect, that makes it so much more attainable for me. And so even though I had that giant fail facing me, I realized that if we really think more deeply about those single stories that we tell the world, and instead focus on the untold story of our inner selves, we create much more accessible access to opportunity for all. Now, in this final story, it's about how technology helps us shatter the single story. Um, as a district uh, tech leader, a lot of people would ask me, what is our goal for technology? I'd be speaking in front of our school board to families, and they say, what do you want technology to do for our kids? To enhance our connection to resources, to experts, uh, to um, you know, more test prep materials, to college, and I'm like, yes, yes, okay, all of those things. But most importantly, I hope that technology enhances our connection to each other. If done well, technology should not dehumanize us. It shouldn't be students sitting in front of screens watching videos over and over again for eight hours a day. But instead, it should help them tap deeper into their empathy, their humanity, and create more connections with one another. And so one way that we did this in our schools was by amplifying our students' untold stories. We were helping them get an access to an audience that they otherwise would not have. We would do that through social media platforms and by helping them to create their own digital media. Uh, this is just a quick compilation of some of the stories that my students told over the years. So my students created all these videos throughout the year. We shared them um, widely, and it was really important to them that lots of people heard their voices, saw them telling the stories, sharing the messages that mattered to them. At the end of uh, their years in our school, we had a PK through eight school. So our students spent about 10 to 11 years with us. And upon eighth grade graduation, we would always do a post survey where one of their teachers would sit down with them in a round circle and kind of get some user feedback from our kids about how we did as a school with them over the past decade. So I sat down with this class in their original kindergarten classroom, and I asked them, what was the one most impactful thing we did for you during your time here at the school? And this is what they had to say.
I love what Taylor has to say there, that it remembers who we are and that it helps us be someone inside of school and outside of school, that Jalen is saying that when we share a voice with the world, I don't have to be nervous. I'm already sharing myself everywhere so I can be myself fully and completely, just like my mother had said. Now, I have a little epilogue for you, and it's about a bluebird. Uh, remember, so when I, remember I, I decided on Miss Buckman's, uh, you know, carpet that I wanted to be a teacher. So when I graduated from college with my teaching license in hand and had my first teaching role teaching the same grade Miss Buckman had taught fourth grade, I was so excited. I actually reached out to her. I called my old elementary school. I found out where she was. She had just retired that year. They forwarded a message on to her and she agreed to meet me for lunch when I was back home for the summer between uh, graduation and starting my first year as a classroom teacher. I walked in and Miss Buckman truly uh, had the fountain of youth in her backyard because she uh, was in, looked exactly the same as when I had seen her when I was in grade four. And she was sitting next to this giant bag, smiling, just waiting for me. And I walked in, I gave her a big hug, and I said, Miss Buckman, guess what? She said, you graduated from college, decided to be a fourth grade teacher and have a role in teaching uh, fourth grade at Chicago Public Schools. And I was like, oh. Okay, I guess this lunch is over. Good to see you. Uh, and I said, how did you know that? I mean, I know you're a wizard, but, but how? And she smiled at me, that knowing look that your teacher gives you. And she reached in this big bag, and she pulled out a bundle of letters wrapped in twine. And as I looked at the letters, I realized that they all had my mother's handwriting on it. And I realized that my mother and Miss Buckman had been writing letters, sharing Christmas cards ever since I graduated from her class in fourth grade. They had stayed in touch. And to have these two powerful, impactful women in my life for all of these years writing letters about me behind my back <laughs> was both infuriating and very nice and heartwarming. And so, you know, as I sat there thinking about my mom and Miss Buckman chatting uh, over the years about me, um, I said to her, well, well Miss Buckman, since you know everything about me, I just have to tell you that, I don't know if my mom said this, but I became a teacher because of you. She's like, oh, I didn't know that. And I said, yeah, I, I've, ever since I was in your classroom, I've always wanted to be a teacher, and it was because of you. And Miss Buckman, I'm telling you, I've spent the whole summer thinking about the first day of school. I already came up with this crazy outfit I'm going to wear. I'm going to mess up my hair. I'm going to fall into the classroom like you did. I'm, I just want my kids to be as surprised and excited about their adventure as I was when I was nine years old in your classroom. I want to be just like you. And Miss Buckman said to me, oh, honey, you can't be just like me. And I thought, oh, my God, what? Oh. Can you, uh, the hubris, I was so embarrassed. I was like, Miss Mc oh gosh, Miss Buckman, I did not mean I'm gonna be just, of course I could never be just like you. There's only one Miss Buckman, but I wanna be kind of as close to you as I could possibly get. And she said, to me, no, 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 Jenny, you misunderstand me. If you try to be me, then who will be you? This woman was still teaching me. She said to me, Jenny, you shouldn't try and become your role models. You need to exceed your role models. Walk into that classroom and be yourself. Your, your kids don't need another Miss Buckman. I'm retiring, I'm done. You need to be the best back then Miss Cho that your kids could ever hope for. That's what they need, that's what they deserve. That's better than trying to be me. In fact, I have something for you. And she reached into that bag, and she pulled out this glass blue bird. And I recognized it was the blue bird that sat on her desk every single day of her career. And she said to me, remember this blue bird of happiness? I'm like, yes, I do. She goes, this would be the blue bird of happiness that I would talk to when you kids were being crazy. I'd say, blue bird, please help me from not killing these children. <laughs> blue bird, blue bird, please grant me the patience. Give me your happiness. And I said, yeah, I do. Thank you, Bluebird. We're still alive because of you. <laughs> and she said to me, Jenny, I will give you my Bluebird of happiness if you do me one thing. And I was like, anything, give me that bird. <laughs> she said to me, Jenny, 
Go into that classroom and be your whole self. Be your whole self just like your mother. And she knew about my mother's Kyungshin story because my mother told that story to everyone. <laughs> and she said, you be your whole self so that your kids can model, that you model that for them so they can learn to be their whole selves. And so I say to all of you, educators in the room, supporters of educator in the room, look around your classroom. Find those little students, the Kyungshins, the Kellos, the Katies. Every single child in your classroom has an untold story inside of them. Every single child in the classroom has some single story they're suffering under that needs to be shattered. Look at your colleagues. Ask yourselves what single stories are holding them back, what untold stories need to be unlocked. Think about your schools, your communities. Think about yourselves. And I ask you, I implore you, to take those single stories and to shatter them. Find the untold stories and set them free. Thank you.